So thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, and of course, I'd like to start off by, by uh, thanking all the people I work with. So I, I have the pleasure of working with a, a bunch of really great students. Now, she said I was a computer scientist. It's actually not correct. I'm actually a mathematician. Right? I'm actually a mathematician. So every math talk should start off with, with some definitions. OK, so ready? OK, good. So a few definitions. Uh, when I say I, what I really mean is, is we. And um, when I say we, what I really mean is they. Right? But, but they do all the hard work. They do all the hard work. I sit in my ivory tower and kind of like, you know, you know, you know drink my tea and thing. But every, everything that really happens is, is they do. Now, um, I'm a mathematician. And um, I, I, this isn't a math talk, though I actually have two slides with math on them. But I promise that's it. And the rest of it will be more about computing and Python and, and, all, and all those kind of things that you're actually interested in. So let me start off with, with an apology. Um, so Python has an awesome community. And it's just amazing the number of libraries that are being generated every day. You know, that people are working on that make data science research easier, better, cooler. And there's just no way I can do, do justice to the community in just 30 minutes. So if there's a developer in here of a library that you think I should be using and I don't say, maybe I use you anyway, but please tell me, right? Please tell me, because I, I love to hear about more tools. And um, ask questions. I, people leave questions to the end. Just, just, just ask questions whenever you want, OK? OK, so what kind of problems are I interested in? So I mean, there have been, over the past you know, number of years, you know, many different kinds of cyber incidents. You know, Stuxnet, Flame, Target got hacked, Neiman Marcus, Affinity Gaming, Dairy Queen. Dairy Queen got hacked, right? And really, that's the point for me where this became personal. Right? When, when Dairy Queen got hacked, I'm like, OK, you know, I, have to, I have to spend my life trying to stop these people from, from doing these things, OK? So um, what kind of problems am I interested in? So I, I'm interested in kind of like I don't know, the, some of the hard problems, right? So you know, maybe there's somebody, and they want to get into your, to your network. Now, now, people have been working on perimeter defenses basically forever, right? And perimeter defenses do a really good job stopping the easy stuff. I would claim, maybe people will argue with me, they don't do such a good job stopping the, the good attacks, the hard attacks, right? So what I'm interested in is, you know, once they're inside, you know, once somebody has, you know, once somebody has read their email and go, oh my gosh, I got this PDF from somebody I never met before. Let me click on it right now, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, once they're inside your network, how do you detect them moving around inside your network? Right? I mean, I'm going to claim that if your machine has the crown jewels on it and you click on PDFs that you, don't, you get from people you don't know about and they can exfiltrate that data in a few seconds, you're stuffed. Right? You're stuffed. On the other hand, if somebody breaks into a computer inside your perimeter, but actually what they're looking for is someplace else, right? on somebody else's computer, maybe you can get them while they're trying to pivot inside your network. And that's the place that I'm interested in trying to find them, to try and catch them, when they're pivoting inside the network to get from their entry point to the place where they really want to be. Now, here's kind of like the, the workflow, I mean, the, the, the kind of computational workflow. Um, first, you need to gather data. Right? You need to gather data. Um, then from that data, you need to generate features, something you're going to be doing machine learning on. Then you want to you, you store those features somewhere so you have easy access to them. Then you actually want to do the machine learning. You know, how do you decide, is this an attack? Is this not an attack? What have you? And then you have to somehow present this to people so they actually you know, understand what's going on. Now, um, I'm not going to attempt to try and cover all of these today. I'm going to focus on those three pieces of the chain. Are there any Blaze developers in the room? OK, good. I love Blaze, but I'm not going to talk about Blaze. Um, are there any, are there any, any Boca developers in the room? Again, I love it. I'm not going to talk about it today. OK, good. So data capture. You know, how do I go off and get all the information that I need for doing the machine learning that I want to do? So um, I'm interested in network data. And so um, I kind of think about network data in kind of two different ways. So first off, there's just the packets, right? You know, everybody know what a network packet is? Oh, wow, awesome, good, OK. So I mean, just, just to kind of say the words, you know, whenever, you, you know, whenever you're watching YouTube, whenever, you, whenever you're gathering data on the network, 
you know, your, 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 actual, your actual image, your actual movie is cut into a bunch of pieces, and that gets sent on the network. And um, these packets have a lot of information inside of them. They have, you know, where they're from, where they're going to, what protocol they're using, what ports they're for, all these kinds of things. And then they have a whole bunch of data, the actual payload, the thing that you're really interested in. So you can look at this problem as a packet processing problem. Can you decide which packets are the ones that are indicative of an attack? Now, that's, that's a good problem. It's a fun problem. It, it, it's also very hard. Um, another way to look at this is in terms of, of flows. You know, maybe what I want to do is, is I want the input to what I'm working on, the input to my algorithms, not to be the individual packets, but to be collections of packets that correspond to some, to, to some particular communication. Right? So, so these are the kind of things I want to play around with. These are the kind of things that I want to go off and say, hey, this particular packet is a good one or a bad one. This particular flow is a good one or a bad one. Now, Python's wonderful. Right? There are an amazing number of tools to help you do these kinds of things. Right? Now, there are standard tools, things like Wireshark, you can use for, for, for looking at these network traces. But then Python itself, there are actually native Python packages, many of them, for going off and dissecting packets, turning these packets into something which is a little more tractable for processing. Some of the big ones are pcappy, impacket, scappy. And um, I was just curious, so I, I, went, I went to PyPy and did a search for how many packages are there for doing pcap processing. 50 plus, there were more than 50 packages on PyPy for doing pcap processing. So lots of people working on this stuff. Now, what I'm more interested in, though, is a little kind of higher level interface. And um, one of the things that I use a lot for um, data processing is this thing called Snort. So, so Snort is one, of the, is one of the standard packages for doing intrusion detection on networks. Now, what Snort does is a little different than what I'm interested in. So what Snort does is it looks for template-based detections. You know, it knows that if you send this particular bit sequence over port 80, that's some buffer overflow attack, right? So I'm not actually, I, 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 I'm kind of a more of an unsupervised learning kind of guy. But one thing that makes Snort really nice is that beyond its, you know, its intrusion detection functionality, it'll actually take packets and pull them apart and do all kind of messy things with them that you, that, that you um, need for doing this kind of processing. And again, there are Python tools. So there's this thing called IDS tools, which actually is designed for going off and parsing the packets, you know, parsing the internal, the internal format that Snort produces. Now, um, there are other similar things what called Bro and, and Sarkasha. And amazingly, these have Python hooks as well. So Python is, is, is very popular, and there are just many packages that people seem to say, hey, you know, we want to we go off and extend our functionality. They use Python for doing that, even in this kind of, kind of network analysis community. Now, once you have your data in some kind of format, you want to generate features. And this is almost the most important part of machine learning. I mean, if you do a good job generating features, then the rest of the machine learning can actually be pretty easy, right? The rest of the machine learning can be pretty easy. So the question is, what kind of features do you want? So you can look at features that are based upon just the network itself, things like port number, IP address, things like this. Um, you can also use the intrusion detection systems themselves for generating features. I mean, what you should think about here is that maybe I go off and I use Snort to label many packets. Right? And it labels many packets OK, and it labels many packets not OK. And I go off and I combine both the raw packet information and the things I get from the intrusion detection system, and I try and predict one from the other. I say, hey, can I predict what the intrusion detection system is going to say based upon the data that's in the packets? Now, when I do that, I can maybe say, hey, you know what? Here's a packet that really Snort should have labeled anomalous, and it didn't. Well, why is that? Well, but remember, Snort has a template. Snort's looking for particular bit streams for doing its, for, for doing its labeling of packets. And maybe somebody changed, with, changed the attack a little bit. The attack vector is very similar to a previous one, but not exactly. And because it's not exactly similar, Snort says, OK by me, looks good to me. But then a more kind of like advanced machine learning technique can say, you know what? I know Snort labels all these, labeled all these packets bad, and here's one it didn't label bad, but that one it didn't label bad is so close to the ones that were bad, maybe I want to label it. 
Okay? There are more advanced things you can do, like information theoretic kind of things, like look at, pa like look at packet payload entropy. You should think about this in that, you know, compression images, these things have high entropy, text, emails, those kind of things have low entropy. And you can also look at kind of host-based data as well. Um, okay, good. So, uh, so I like quizzes. I'm a professor. So I'm going to give you guys a quiz, okay? Okay, ready? So um, this is some data that's been measured from the Internet 2 backbone, right? The Internet 2 backbone. And so um, this trace here, this little squiggly line, that's a measure of how utilized a particular link is on the Internet 2 backbone, right? So when, that, when, when it's high, the link is, is, is heavily used. When it's low, the link is, is not used very much. So here's a question. What time period is that? I mean, is that a microsecond of measurements? Is that a minute of measurements? Is that a, uh, a week of measurements, a year of measurements? How long of a time period is, is this uh, squiggly line right here? What do you think? I'm sorry? If, if it's a power of small signal, then it could actually be any. Uh, I disagree. I, 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 you can actually look at that. You can actually look at that. And from that plot, you can actually figure out what that time period is. It's a unit. I'm sorry? It's a unit. OK, great. What unit? <laughs> a microsecond? Who says a microsecond? Oh, come on. You guys, who says a minute? Who says a day? Who says a month? Who says a week? Ah! Say, say that a little louder. Yeah, you see, so, so what's going on here, this is, uh, this is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the, the, the work day, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Now, what this image down here is, this is a visualization of like all the links put together in one, one big image, right? So each row of this image is a, is a plot that looks like this. So here's a tricky bit, ready? Here's a tricky bit. Where's the anomaly? Are these spikes anomalous? Maybe they're just normal, right? You know, if, if you look at this data, so there's a spike there. Now, now here's something kind of weird. Here's two links that are shifted by a little bit of time. Is that an anomaly, right? So what, one problem in this business is, how do you define an anomaly? How do you figure out what is the thing that you're looking for, okay? Now, um, who, who, who's, who here is sort of deep learning? Oh, very long, great, okay. So, so what, deep learning is, is a beautiful, very modern, technique in, very modern technique in machine learning. And the idea of deep learning is to automatically generate features, right? So you hand it a whole bunch of data, some of it's crap, some of it's useful, and it figures out what are the combinations of the data that you hand it that are actually meaningful, that actually do a good job representing the data. Right? So, so this thing has not, to, to, as, as far as I'm aware, been very highly used yet for looking at computer network data. I mean, this is used all the, I mean, if you have a cell phone, if you have a cell phone, you have deep learning in your pocket, right? Because voice recognition these days, all deep learning. Image recognition these days, all deep learning. But it hasn't been used so much yet for looking at network data. Now, again, Python is wonderful. There are many Python libraries for doing deep learning. And here's really the idea of it, right? You go off and you try and like generate hierarchies of features. You say, hey, I want to represent faces. Well, at the lowest level, faces are represented by edges. At a higher level, faces are represented by combinations of edges that make things like eyes and nose and ears. And then I can combine up eyes and noses and ears at an even higher level to make faces. So instead of representing a face as pixels, as saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to represent this face as just a collection of pixels, I represent that face as some um, you know, combination of basis functions that look like faces. Now, the cool part is it does this automatically. It figures out this represent, that this is a good representation for the data on its own. Now, um, as you might imagine, that's kind of computationally expensive. It can be. And one of the things that's recently made um, recently made uh, deep learning very popular is the fact that people had figured out how to do it on GPUs. Right? They figured out how to quickly do deep, deep learning on GPUs. And again, Python's cool. There are many libraries for that. So the you know, MPI for Pi, this is a library for doing MPI across um, you know, big supercomputers. 
PyCUDA and Py, OpenCL are kind of like lower level routines for doing parallel computing on, on GPUs and other kinds of um, local hardware. And this really cool thing, Numba, I love Numba. This is, a, this is kind of a, a, another Python library for doing high performance computing, right? Now, these are kind of low level routines. It's very nice, uh, there are high level routines too. So two of the more popular ones are called a Theano, which has been around for, for quite a while. Another one by Google called TensorFlow. So what are these? These are Python libraries that give you the building blocks for making your own deep learning networks. It's also really cool. These things underneath the sheets use the previous library. So for example, these run on GPUs. Now, so these are maybe, if you're not a deep learning expert, some of these can be a little bit kind of hard to use. So other people have gone off and made higher level higher level libraries that take these building blocks and actually give you kind of full neural networks, full deep learning networks. Um, PyLearn2, Keras, and my, my favorite, lasagna. Why lasagna? Layers, right? Come on, layers. Right? So, yeah, so people, people have good senses of humor. Okay, so machine learning. Um, just to kind of say the words, machine learning is, is kind of divided into two pieces, supervised and unsupervised. So supervised is where somebody gives you a bunch of examples that are labeled. Maybe somebody gives you a bunch of pictures of cats, pictures of dogs, and they say, hey, here's a new picture. Is it a dog or a cat? What I'm more interested in is the unsupervised learning, where you're just given unlabeled data, right? Maybe I'm just giving a bunch of unlabeled packets. And from those, I want to figure out structure. I want to find structure in the data. I want to find clusters in the data. Maybe I want to find manifolds in the data. Now again, there's lots of libraries for these kind of things. Scikit-learn being, uh, Scikit being a big one. But what am I really looking for? What am I really looking for? So this is what I would call a uh, first order anomaly. So can you, where's the anomaly in this data? The spike. Well, but, but why is that anomalous? Why is the spike anomalous? It's, it's different. It's bigger than everybody else, right? What's everybody else? Okay, so how about this data? Where's the anomaly there? Yeah, but it's not bigger than everybody. I mean, over on the left and on the right, it's much bigger than there. So why is that an anomaly? I'm sorry? Yeah, that's right. So there's some kind of like context, right? There's some kind of context for that data. Now, there's actually two contexts for this data, right? One context is, as you say, locally, some kind of like autocorrelation. But another context is maybe with the other data, right? If these two data were the same all the time, and then at some point now they're different, maybe you'd say, well, that's anomalous, right? It's not the fact that that's bigger. It's just the fact that it's not following the same predictions that it used to. It used to be I could predict one from the other quite well. But now the one on the bottom, for that brief moment in time, isn't predictable from the one on the top. That's the kind of anomaly that I'm interested in finding. One of, my, one, of my, one of my math slides. So um, the idea here is that I'm interested in understanding the structure of covariance matrices. I go up and take my data, and my little matrix here, all that this encodes is how similar two of those time series are. For example, like, you know, that, that little dot right there is red because two of these time series are pretty similar. Right? That little dot there is blue because two of these time series are pretty different. So I go off and I take these long, big time series, and I reduce them to just a collection of similarities. Now, one cool thing about this is the data is much smaller. I mean, maybe these things are, you know, um, you know 1,000 by a million, right? 1,000, so I have 1,000 sensors, and I have a million measurements, but the covariance matrix is only 1,000 by 1,000. Now, the question is, how much information is contained in this little guy? can be a lot. Okay? Now, here's the, really the kind of anomaly that I'm looking for. Where's the anomaly here? The third spike on the top. Yeah, OK, but why? Why is that anomalous? Because there's no corresponding spike in the lower graph. Okay, but, why not, but, but, the, but, but if you notice, the backgrounds are anti-correlated, right? So the, the top is a sine, the bottom is a cosine. The frequencies are the same. Right, they're actually anti-correlated. The top and the bottom are anti-correlated. 
The spikes are correlated except for that one. So why is that one enough? I mean, I agree with you, but why? It's where the correlation has changed. Right? It's where the correlation has changed. You don't mind the background. You don't see the background as an anomaly, but it's always anti-correlated. Right? You don't see the spikes as an anomaly because they're correlated, except for the one that isn't correlated. So I'm interested in doing that. I'm interested in finding, you know, how do you understand data by way of when predictability changes? The backgrounds, I mean, one background is kind of the anti-correlation, the other is predictable with a minus sign. The spikes are predictable except for that one. That's my anomaly, the one spike that isn't predictable. My second math slide. So the idea here is I'm going to do kind of a low rank analysis. I'm going to try and take my signal and divide it into um, a background term and a, um, you know, we're kind of like, this, this is the stuff that everybody on the network feels. Like, what, what kind of things are felt across the network? Time of day, day of week, right? You also have a noise term. These are things that are felt locally and not felt anyplace else. And then these are the cool ones. These terms here, these are the, the, these are the correlations that are felt locally. I mean, you and I are correlated in a way that nobody else is. You can predict me from him, but you can't predict me from anybody else. Now, I'm interested in when that changes. Maybe I'm not predictable from you anymore. Well, why is that? Maybe now I am predictable from you. That was you're attacking me. OK? So that's the idea. Now, um, here's just kind of a picture of, of this kind of thing, where I go off and I have a, a, co a covariance matrix M. And the idea here is that inside, that inside that noise, there are a few dots that are weird. There are a few dots that you can't explain. Right? And so the L, this is a pure background. This is just the background where everybody is happy and explainable. And this S, just those few dots there, those are the few places where points in M are not explainable from other points in M. Now, you may ask, you may ask, Randy, does this happen in real data very often? Can you actually go out and measure data and have measured data where things, some things are predictable, like I can predict myself from him. I need him to predict me, but I don't need the rest of you. Well, let's look. So here you go. Does this happen in real data? OK, so here is something called Lander. So this is um, measures of uptime for subnets on the internet. Right? So I go off, and people go off, there are these really cool groups that go off and do these internet measurements. And they measure like what percentage of the time particular subnets, groups of computers, are up or down. Are they reachable or not? This kind of structure appears there. So there's an M. Over here is an S. And I've kind of highlighted a few of the anomalies there. They're exactly the um, LG DACOM subnet in Europe. Now, nobody told me about LG DACOM, but the algorithm was going to figure out on its own that these guys are all related. They are all, they are all correlated in a way that nobody else is. So, so Kata, this is data for doing trace routes on the internet, where you go off and figure out you know, what are the distances between nodes on the internet. And again, the exact structure appears here. Right? Some of these distances are, thank you, are predictable while other ones aren't. Here's another one. So here, so I, I've, I, I have weird things I work on. Insurance satisfaction surveys. Right? Insurance satisfaction surveys. How predictable are people's insurance satisfaction surveys from each other? Well, they're pretty predictable. Right? They're pretty predictable. Except if I get rid of a few anomalies, they're very predictable. There are just a few people that aren't predictable from each other. The rest are incredibly predictable. Okay. How about Amazon product communities? You know, what, what, what products are bought with each other? Again, pretty predictable. I get rid of a few anomalies, it becomes incredibly predictable. Right? Um, so there's, you, there's this guy on data set, this is a, this is a whole internet simulation. Um, we're looking for d distributed denial of service attacks on the, in this internet simulation. Again, predictable, you get rid of just a few anomalies, it becomes super predictable. Um, geolocation internet too. Again, you get rid of a few anomalies, it becomes very predictable. Um, you can scale these things pretty big. You can actually scale these things pretty big. Um, so if you, you can write the underlying mathematics as a convex optimization. And again, there are beautiful Python packages out there for doing convex optimization problems. And so you can scale this. I mean, I have these students working on um, an exabyte size problem, you know, one million sensors, each with a trillion measurements. And there's even more, right? Um, you know, there, there's beautiful things for doing databases. Blaze, high-performance data storage, SQL Alchemy, and lets you go off and 
um, you know, have the same code access many different kind of databases. There's code for graphical models. There's methods out there. There's Python packages for statistical modeling. There's a whole um, slurry of scientific visualization packages out there. And so it makes this kind of analysis very nice. I mean, you can go off, well, let me say the following. All those students you see, they are all, they are all forced to work in Python. Well, why? Well, so they can share data. They can share code, right? If they're working in different languages, it's harder to share. So they're all forced to work in Python. So with that, I'll stop. And I'll ask for any questions. Oh, cool. Over here. So when I think of anomaly detection, I right. try to think of, of the models that would create the anomalies. Yeah. So I can actually get some understanding. Yeah. So your system is clearly identifying things, such as the DACOM yeah. uh, yeah. subnetwork, but it doesn't tell me why it saw the DACOM subnetwork. And those are kind of the deeper questions. You know, For example, anomalies in uh, network behavior, developers look a lot like attackers. Yeah, that's right. Right. And so they're very different uh, conceptual models behind what's going on here. So could you tell me a bit about how your you're helping people get conceptual models into yeah, your analysis. Question. So um, I, I try to be careful. Maybe I made a few mistakes here. I try to be careful and say, I'm interested in finding anomalies, right? Because when you try to find an attack, that means that somebody has darkness in their heart, right? Right? Somebody has darkness in their heart. And until you give me a darkness in heart sensor, I'm not sure how I can find any dependence on darkness in heart, right? So um, the idea here is to go off and find anomalies. Now, one thing that I think is important, um, well, let me back up. So modeling is awesome, but sometimes modeling can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You know, things in your model are anomalous or not anomalous a priori, and maybe independent of the data, independent of the data. So the idea here is to let the data stand on its own two feet, right? Anomalies are defined, I mean, the, the, the normalcy of a network is defined by who's predictable from who, right? So I, I run the network and I say, okay, now I know we need each other, I need you, those three need those three. I understand how the network is dependent on, how all the pieces of the network are dependent on each other. And then I search for departures from that, right? So the question becomes, when I call up the guy in the knock, and I say, hey, knock guy, you know what? Um, never, you know, you know, person A's computer is now correlated with the boss's computer, and never was before. Do you want to go talk to person A and see why they're correlated with the boss's computer? If that's interesting to the guy in the knock, I feel like I've succeeded, whether it's an attack or not, right? Whether it's an attack, whether it's a misconfiguration, whether it's whatever. If the guy in the knock is interested, I consider my job to be done. So coming full circle, um, I don't work with models because I worry them coloring too much what's going on. I want the data to stand on its own. The only way I know how to do that is by understanding the interdependencies between the data and see what they change. So we have time for one more question. Shoot. Right. Uh, Google uh, has a fraud API yeah. right, that is publicly available. Um, that means that once a billion of people yeah. will upload their uh, credit card transactions into Google, yeah. and Google will run uh, neural networks on all these transactions, yeah. right? The problem will be solved. What do you think? Nope. Why? Well, because, OK, so um, one thing that makes this problem as crazy hard as it is, and actually maybe impossible, maybe, maybe I'm a fool to even try, right? But one thing that makes this problem really hard is the people the, the anomalies that you're looking for are being generated by people that are at least as smart as you are, right? People who are really smart trying their darndest to hide what they're doing are the ones generating this anomaly. So I would claim that any fixed system, any fixed set of you know, rules, features, what have you, um, can solve the problem. Now, maybe Google can gather enough data that they can very quickly detect new attacks, 
right, an attack that nobody's ever done before. It seems like a hard problem. That's your question? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>